There is a beautiful saying in the old Jewish scriptures, the Mishnah. He who rescues a single soul, it is as if he saved the world entire. And while at the Weizmann Institute of Science we truly live by this phrase, it is also true in the deep biological sense. Because if you think about a single person, about any one of our bodies, they are in fact a world of life comprised of billions of tiny living entities, our cells. And if we think about this analogy of our body as a world or a planet, then each of our different organs would be a country in such a world. And zooming in to one of these countries, we could think of ourselves as an independent city capable of surviving by itself but communicating with other cities to create a functional country and world. So why do I like this analogy of cells and a city? Because just like our cities, our cells are also extremely organized living structures that were designed to enable optimal life. And just like when we look around the world, we see many different cities, be it London or Rome or Rehovot, not in any particular order of importance. So do we have many different types of cells in our body, blood cells, nerve cells, skin cells? And while there are unique identifiers to each city, a leaning tower, the London Bridge, the Weizmann Institute of Science, and while there are unique identifiers to cells, like the capacity to move oxygen or convey information, what I am most intrigued about is the fact that fundamentally all cities and all cells rely on the same basic functions to survive. So let me zoom you in a minute and take you to see some of these basic cellular structures and functions. Of course, to protect a city from intruders, every city and every cell must have a cell wall or a membrane. Looking inside, every city must have a municipality to decide how the city will be run and make the rules. And cells too have a nucleus inside of which our genetic material, the DNA, is stored. And that is where the decisions on how the cell will function are carried out. Every city requires a power supply to enable smooth running of the various functions. And our cells too have specialized areas in the cell, organelles, called mitochondria, that are the powerhouse and provide chemical energy for the cell to function. Of course, no city can survive without communication with the cities around it and the, the uh, commerce of different uh, molecules. And so do cells have a secretory pathway enabling them to communicate and transfer important molecules between cells. And no city would be complete without a rubbish dump, but cells are highly specialized recycling machines. We should learn from them. And they perform these functions in a small organelle called the lysosome. To move between these different cellular areas, road paths, highways exist both in cities and in the cells where they're called cytoskeleton. But of course, just like a city isn't merely a sum of its buildings and structures, so are cells not just a complex of organelles working together. Rather, what makes a city alive are the workers, the people residing inside the city. In the cell, these workers are proteins. These proteins encoded inside our genetic material in genes are the ones that carry out all of the essential cellular functions and enable the cells to function properly. So if we want to truly understand how a cell works, what we need to do is we need to know what are all the workers doing at any given moment. And here comes the biggest problem of cell biology in the 21st century. 
Despite decades of research, thousands of labs, millions of dollars in funding, we still, to date, only know what 30% of the proteins are doing. And this is a problem if we envision a future of personalized medicine where we will just walk into the doctor's office and he'll be able to read our genetic material and provide us with a tailored treatment for our condition. But if scientists and doctors don't understand what is written in 70% of our genes, then that makes this vision still far from being a reality. And so in my lab, we've made it our mission to understand what every protein in the cell is doing and to do that using methodologies that enhance the rate of discovery. And to give you an example of how we can do that, I want to focus on one tiny such organelle area in the cell called the peroxisome. And we want to understand what are all the proteins that go to peroxisomes and hope that this will give us a clue on what these proteins do. Just like if I know that a worker is going to the hospital, it immediately gives me a clue that it's maybe a doctor or a nurse or a technician that runs the x-ray machine. So join me in focusing in on this tiny, tiny peroxisome. Very few people have heard about it, but it's an extremely important organelle because it breaks down very complex fats that we eat in our diet. And this is important both for energy utilization, but also for eliminating toxic fats that exist in our food. Another very important function of the peroxisome is the breakdown of free radicals. These exist in nearly anything fun that you want to do. Eating junk food, drinking wine, or driving at high speeds in an open-roofed car. But accumulation of free radicals promotes the onset of cancer and cardiovascular diseases, as, many other, as, as well as many other conditions, and enhances the process of aging. And so it is really no wonder that the peroxisome being so important. If children are born in the absence of highly functional peroxisomes, they suffer from what we call peroxisomal diseases. These diseases result in slow deterioration of all bodily functions and early premature death. To date, none of these diseases have a cure. They're extremely difficult to diagnose, and many children go incorrectly diagnosed for many, many years. And so we would like to know how these peroxisomes function and what are all the proteins that work there. And we would love to study it in humans where these diseases occur, but doing research in humans is quite difficult. And I told you that at their fundamental base, all cells work in exactly the same way. And so we can use a much simpler cell to study peroxisomes, basically to study any cellular function. And we use these cells that all of you know from the supermarket, the baker's yeast also sometimes called the brewer's yeast. And of course, these tiny fungi are well-loved by all of us because they make bread and beer and wine. But in the lab, we study them because they're very powerful model organisms that are easy to genetically manipulate and study. And of course, they contain the same cellular structures as our cells, and their proteins carry out very similar functions to our proteins. And so if we want to look at a cell, a yeast cell or a human cell, and try to find out where peroxisomes are, it is actually quite difficult, because under a regular light microscope, cells look, well, like these gray blobs. So how can we know in this resolution, where peroxisomes are. To do that, we have to utilize a trick that I'm going to tell you about. Many years ago, scientists found that it's possible to take a gene out of jellyfish, a gene that enables the fluorescence of the jellyfish underwater. They called that gene the gene for the green fluorescent protein. And by using genetic engineering technologies, 
put it into the genome of any other model organism, creating these lovely fluorescent animals that would be a wonderful gift to any child for Hanukkah. But in the lab, we use them for much more serious experiments. We fuse the gene for green fluorescent protein with a protein that we want to follow in the cell. For example, a peroxisomal protein. And now these proteins will move together and highlight where peroxisomes are. And you can see in this fluorescent microscopy image the peroxisomes glowing in bright green on the background of the cellular structures. So this is great because we can now take a protein and know if it's inside a peroxisome. And this is really easy to do for one protein, but in fact extremely difficult or nearly impossible to do for thousands of proteins that exist inside any living cell. And so I feel very lucky that 12 years ago, when I joined the Weizmann Institute, I was supported in creating one of the first completely robotic laboratories that enable us to do experiments at a throughput that students and lab workers simply cannot do. Basically, utilizing 21st century robotic and computerized technology to run thousands of experiments in parallel. And I made a little movie to show you how that works. And in that movie, there's a movie star that carries 50% of my genes. Let's see if you can figure out who it is. You can see that in our lab, doing genetics for thousands of strains is child's play. Here, a rotor robot is genetically manipulating the cells, enabling scientists to introduce genes into the cells, take genes out, or shuffle their order. The cells can be taken to the automated robotic laboratory that you can see here. Here, once the cells are deposited, no more manual intervention is required, and thousands of samples a day can be run and uh, analyzed for various biological readouts. In this specific experiment that you are seeing here, these cells are going to be transferred to a special plate that goes into the microscope and allows us to measure hundreds of different genetically modified cells for the localization of the proteins inside them. Here the cells are moving into the high-resolution microscope, fluorescent microscope, and in that microscope not only are images taken automatically, but also analyzed already on a computer, enabling the output already analyzed to be read by the scientists working in the lab, identifying the various functions of the proteins and their various localizations. And you can see a successful, successful completion of an experiment there. So now, using these types of methodologies, we know what every single peroxisomal protein is. And why is this important? Because we can now take patients with diseases that haven't been diagnosed. And if their genome has been sequenced, we can look if they have mutations in these peroxisomal genes, enabling to assign them as peroxisomal diseases. But this is not enough, because the children suffering from these peroxisomal diseases need hope. They're each unique individuals, sometimes with as little as a handful of children suffering from the same disease, making them part of a huge family of 300 million people worldwide affected from what we call rare diseases. And why do we call them rare diseases if 300 million people are suffering from them? Because within this family of rare diseases, sometimes only very few individuals suffer from the exact same mutation in the exact same gene, making it impossible to find a single holistic cure for all of them. And so it is no wonder that 95% of these rare disease patients 
currently have no hope of treatment or cure, and no drug company would ever take the time to look for a drug treatment for a disease where less than a handful of children are suffering. And so we've made it our mission in the lab to not only understand which proteins go to peroxisomes, but to understand what each of these proteins does, so that in the future we may offer hope, a treatment, maybe even a cure, to these unique children, because each of these children, to their family, is a world entire. Thank you.